Thanks, everybody, to be here for this uh, first talk in the morning. Um, just a word, I will need to run to the train station afterwards, so I will need to actually limit myself to the time. And if you have any questions, you will need to ask them over the internet. Um, I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been a developer for a long time. I've been a developer after advocate afterwards because I had enough of projects. I had enough of like stupid requirements, changing requirements, project managers, the crunch, whatever, you name it. Um, so I always tell people that now if you don't care about what I'm telling you, that that's fine. I will never know it. Uh, you are here probably because you want or you have just developed your first APA. Who here is in this case? What is the rest doing? Oh, sorry, this is a Slavic audience. Right? Ah, no. <laughs> Are you, did you ever develop an API or do you plan to develop an HTTP API? Yes. Ah, oh, thanks. Yeah. You asked me first time. You asked me the first time. Okay. Ah, good one. So, what should I teach you here? <laughs> um, so if it's your first time, if you're not an experienced person, or if you plan to do it, you probably uh, need to focus on a lot of things, like the regular uh, modeling stuff. What are your entities? What's the relationship? What are the boundaries? And then, as I told, you have all the problems of regular project, the changing requirements, whatever. And then you need to think about, oh, what is REST? Huh? Like, REST is something that a lot of people talk about but nobody can know for sure what it is. You have lots of contradiction. Some people say REST is like the Bible. Somebody wrote a book and then went away, never to be heard again. And now it's up to the people remaining. We need to think, oh, what did he mean? Huh? So it's normal that with all those requirements, all these problems, then you probably forgot about versioning. And when your business comes to you and say, hey, your API has been very successful, then you are faced with this reaction. So in this talk, I want to give you a little of tips and tricks about what can help you uh, like not have this reaction. So um, let's make sure of the initial situation. So you have your application, you have a couple of endpoints, and you like offer them to the internet, right? Well, right? Yeah. yeah, okay, you are all wrong. <laughs> I assume that none of you, absolutely none of you, ever offer their endpoints to the internet without a reverse proxy. Now you have something in between. And that's correct because you want to protect uh, with red limiting, with authentication, with lots and lots of security issues that you, you cannot offer it. So this is the right initial situation. My solution is very simple. Uh, instead of a reverse proxy, you use an API gateway. Good, I will catch my train. Do you have any questions? Um, since this is the short version of the talk, uh, I cannot go into all the explanation between a reverse proxy and an API gateway. Just my definition, which is like, can be debatable, but it will be the one I will be using. Like, uh, an API gateway is a reverse proxy on steroids. It can do everything a reverse proxy can do and more. My usual example is rate limiting. A reverse proxy rate limits by default. That's one of the first features that was invented to prevent you from being DDoSed. Makes a lot of sense. The thing is, rate limiting in reverse proxy is addressed like a technical requirement. You don't want to be DDoSed, and it makes a lot of sense. With the realm of API, probably you want to offer different rate limits depending on whether people pay you and how much they pay you or not. And now it, rate limiting is not a technical requirement anymore. It's a business requirement. And reverse proxy are really, really bad with business requirements because they were not designed for that. You shouldn't put your business logic in a reverse proxy. So API gets away. They have this normally out of the box. That doesn't mean you should push all your business logic to API gateways. It means that 
they are less unfriendly to business logic than reverse proxy. Also something that is, in my opinion, not acceptable anymore. You should be able to change the configuration of a reverse proxy or an API getaway on the fly. Uh, there should be hot reload. If you are using uh, Nginx, which is a very good and very mature reverse proxy, if you use the open source version and you change the configuration, you need to switch it off and on again, which is not super great. Ah, it's time. Um, so here you can see a couple of API gateways that you can install up on premise that are open source. In my demo, I will use Apache API 6 because I wear the Apache API 6 t-shirt and I work also on the project. But normally every gateway should let you do that. I'm not talking about cloud-based one because in general they are much better integrated into your cloud provider, but they are much less feature rich. They are very, very limited. So two slides about Apache API 6. It's quite a major project already. It became a top level project in one year. So if you know about the Apache Foundation, first you give the project to the Apache Foundation, you join the incubator and you need to fulfill a couple of requirements. One of them being you need to have a couple of people from different companies so that not one single company dict dictates the fate of the project. And so the project became a top level one in one year. It's based on Nginx because again, it's a very good and very mature reverse proxy to cope with the fact that you can't change the configuration and reload it on the fly. There is something called OpenResty. OpenResty is a Lua JIT. It allows you to actually change the configuration through Lua scripts. That's very good. The problem is the Nginx configuration and the OpenResty configuration are very, very similar. And it doesn't scale if you want to actually use all the power of the API gateway. So Apache API 6 bring you uh, like some abstractions, so what is a route, what is a service, and everything is plugin based. So now I will do a demo because I've talked a lot, and as I mentioned, <coughs> the solution is to use an API gateway. So I have my application here, I already have my Docker, I will start the Docker compose file and then I will comment it. Docker compose down just to be sure. And now it needs to wake up and Docker compose up. And it seems to be good. So how is my Docker compose file composed? Surprise, surprise. Uh, so I have Apache API 6. Apache API 6 relies on etcd to store its configuration. etcd is a distributed key value store, the same one used by Kubernetes. I probably won't have time to show the dashboard, but anyway, here it is. I want everything monitored, so I have Prometheus and Grafana to show it on the UI. And I have my old API, and I want to migrate to my new API. So the old API is this one. It's a Java project, Spring Boot, and it's very bad because... It <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> OK. Everything is configuration-based. Um, and my new API is much better. Because it's still Spring Boot. <laughs> yeah, at the Red Hat conference, it sucks, right? Um, but it's written in Kotlin, so you were right. Ah, I improved everything because I used Kotlin instead of Java and I removed the annotations. So let's see how it works. Local hosts 8081 slash hello. And that's bad hello world in Java and we can do much better. Like here, this is obviously much better, right? So we want to migrate from version 1 to version 2, the old bad Java stuff to the Kotlin shiny stuff. OK, so we call the API gateway for that. And unfortunately, it's a brand new API gateway. So we need to configure it before it works. Otherwise, it's no use. Um, so for that, we can configure Apache API 6 via an API call. Amazing. Turtles all the way down. So there is this uh, actually route, uh, API 6 admin routes. We will do a put with ID 1. Uh, here we notice that there is a different port because you probably don't want to expose the admin port to the outside world. You want just to keep it 
uh, inside your network. And for added security, we have an API key, which here I'm I've been very lazy because I'm using the default one. Uh, the payloads, the name is optional, but it's better. It gives you a better understanding. And then we have a new array and a methods. By default, the methods are all the methods. And API 6, or probably any API gateway, would check if you, when you receive a request, it matches both the URI and the method. And in this case, it will forward the request to the upstream. So here, the upstream is a single node, which is very, very stupid. Because nowadays, in our container world, the pods, the, the containers, they will come and go. Uh, especially if you are using Kubernetes. So we have service discovery. But here, I don't want to make the things more complicated. I have written everything uh, hard-coded, and it will be a single node. And as I mentioned, I want everything monitored. So I'm using plugin Prometheus. Everything is a plugin, remember? So I run it. And now I can try again, and woohoo, it works. And of course, I'm back to square one. So it's not super interesting, but at least that's my first step. I've introduced the API gateway. Now the second problem is now I want something to be versioned. There are a couple of ways to version an API. The most widespread one, the one that we'll use in this presentation, is path-based. Huh? You use in the path v1 and it forwards you to the V1. Makes sense. The second that everybody talks about, but nobody has ever seen it in the wild, is query parameters. Uh, everybody tells you, hey, you can do it. Yeah, but who does it? Nobody. Well, OK, but it's still, you can do it with Apache ABI 6 if you really want it. The third one is through a header. Either it's a custom header, like X version, or it's through the contents. It's also possible, it's also supported. Here, I will use path-based because it's the most visual one. So I will first, I, will, I, I told you about, hey, we can use abstractions here. I've created everything in one payload. So here, I will use the real abstraction of API 6. I will use another route called upstreams. It's still a put. So I create the, the, the upstream like this, so it can be reused across several uh, routes. Then I create uh, a global rule because I told you I want everything to be monitored. But in my first route, I had to explicitly tell plugin Prometheus. And guess what? At some point, one admin will forget to add it. And I bet you that it will be the route that you will need to debug. So I want that everything be monitored by default. So I will create a global rule to say, OK, every, every route that will be created from now on will be um, monitored via Prometheus. And then I create the version route. So route number two, I do a put. Here you can see that I am actually referencing the upstream that I created. And I'm rest, uh, um, referencing a plugin config ID that is above. Why do I need that? Because now that I am introducing path-based uh, versioning, if I forward v1 slash hello to my upstream, my upstream will tell me, uh, no, it doesn't work. Because it only knows about slash hello, not about slash v1 slash hello. So I need to remove the prefix before I forward. And that's the idea behind this plugin config. There is a proxy rewrite where I say v1 whatever, I keep the whatever. And remember, I do it on a route called v1 slash hello. So here, now I have same. Amazing. And now the thing is, the old users won't migrate because it's just not cost effective. And the new users, there's a chance they will still use the unversion route because they need to type less characters, right? And we are lazy. Uh, so we need to uh, tell people, stop using this unversion route. It's not good. It's not good. But how do you contact them? Because when we offered our API to the world, we didn't think about making people register. And if somebody thought about it, then you would have told, no, it's, it's a needed friction. You don't want 
friction between you and your user. And it makes a lot of sense. But now we are in dire need of contacting our user, but we can't. So the only thing we can rely on is actually our good friend HTTP. <laughs> hey, no other choice. Um, so we will communicate through HTTP and tell our uh, users, uh, no, don't do that anymore. How do you do that? Well, there is a plugin for that. So if you use the first route, and then we will redirect them to whatever they wanted. So now if I use the V1, and I will make it verbose, uh, tells you, oops. So that's also a good lesson for you who are actually consuming APIs is please monitor your consumption unless you want to have this kind of stuff happen to you. But you can tell me, oh, but we are smarter than that. And I believe it, because you are developers. We do auto-follow. <laughs> hey, and no breaking changes. Uh, congrats, you've just doubled the number of requests, so probably your cloud bill as well. So the lesson is, please really monitor your API consumption as well. All of these issues wouldn't be there if we had actually asked people to register. Right? Who here likes to register? <laughs> ah. You don't want my spammy emails? <laughs> Obviously you don't, but you want free stuff. <laughs> yeah, everybody wants free stuff. Um, so perhaps we can find something that is mutually beneficial, saying, OK, uh, you give me your email. I promise you not to spam you, TM. And, um, and then you will enjoy unlimited calls. If you, if you uh, don't want to give your email, that's fine too. You can continue using my API, but you will be replimited. OK? Um, makes sense. It's marketing plot, but it works. Um, I tried to find a, a plugin for that. Uh, I didn't find it. So what did I do as a good developer? I copy-pasted an existing plugin. And I, I changed, well, I inserted a bit of my uh, business logic. Who here is a Lua developer? OK, I can show you the codes. <laughs> because I'm not a Lua developer, and I, I don't like to look like an idiot. So everything is copied from one of the red limiting plugins. And here I inserted my 10 lines of code. And that I can do. I, I'm not a Lua developer, but, well, I mean, I tested, it works more or less. <laughs> so the idea is um, if we check there is a specific header in the requests, and if this header is, a, uh, we, we find this header in a, a plugin called KeyAuth. I will talk about KeyAuth just afterwards. And with this KeyAuth, we have somebody who actually has been authenticated, then we break. We return, otherwise we apply the rate limiting logic, which I won't show because it works and uh, it's not important. So here I'm reusing exactly the same config as the initial plugin, and it says, okay, if you call me more than once in a 60 seconds time window, uh, I will reject you with 429 and you can register there. So registration is not part of this talk, but here you can see that now I can call V1. And it tells me nicely to go somewhere else. So as I mentioned, uh, there are many ways that you can register. Uh, we actually have authentication integrated with Keycloak. Right? Write that for the win. Huh? Uh, with Open ID Connect, with whatever. Here, I use the simplest plugin called uh, KeyAuth uh, because I'm super lazy. And KeyAuth is if you have a specific header, and if is there there is known uh, from Apache API 6, then it assigns you this ID. So I will just need to create this what we call a consumer. So again, a new route, the consumer's route. So if I have an API key header, 
with the value my key, I will be authenticated as John Doe. And because of the 10 lines of codes that I've created in my plugin, I won't be rate limited. Let's try. Uh, API key equals my key. Uh, no rate limit. Um, now I'm checking, I perhaps a bit in advance so I can show you the, uh, it's 9000, the dashboard. So of course here it's not admin admin, as you can imagine. It's admin something very complicated and very secured. Here you can see my two routes that I've created. You can see the upstream that I created. You can see the consumer that I just created. And you can see the global rule. Uh, you can check uh, the JSON that is actually stored in the CD and there is a direct change available. Um, so here you can see it has been changed directly. Uh, if Actually, your users are not sysadmins or developers or DevOps or whatever you want to call them. If they are regular business users, you can offer them this dashboard. Uh, it can also be restricted, whatever. But my point is, under the hood, there, there is this API call that I have just done. It's just that there is a nice UI around them. OK, uh, so it's pretty good, right? Now we are able to actually contact our user to tell them, hey, we will be changing the version. So before deploying the new version, what do you do? Who said that? What did you say exactly? Thanks. Very good. There was at least one engineer in the room. <laughs> Who is doing unit testing? Integration testing. Testing in production. <laughs> So, people who didn't raise their hand, they lied. <laughs> because in the realm of API, it's even truer. Everybody tests in production. Because even if you test a lot of things in unit test, if you test a lot of things in your integration tests, there is no way you can test all the possible payloads that your user will send you. At some point, you need to test in, in production. So before, testing, uh, before testing in real production, we should do canary testing, right? Uh, before doing canary testing, we can do something a bit smarter. Though, what we can do is actually we can duplicate the loads, the production loads, send it to V1 and V2, and check that the, either the payload, the response payload, or the HTTP status is the same. And if it's the same across, I don't know, 99.99%, it's a pretty good sign that it's the same and we can continue. So we shall do that with something called the proxy mirror traffic. So I will send the, the, the load to the V2 as well. And here, I'm very proud of this. Thanks. I'm very proud of the snippets uh, because when I first presented this talk, it didn't work. And the reason for that is that the proxy rewrites had a lower priority than the proxy mirror. The priority is how Apache API 6 orders the plugin, how it executes them in turn. And it's hard coded by default. And because some things make more sense than others. And at the time, you couldn't actually override the priority. So what happened is that the proxy mirror was executed before the proxy rewrite. Remember, proxy rewrite removes the v1. So you actually sent v1 slash hello to the proxy mirror, and it didn't work. So now it works. And let's try a couple of times. works as well. Uh, I'm so good a developer, I can write a hello world in an API. And now we can check our friend Grafana 
so everything is configured. Here, I have taken the default API 6 dashboard and I have added two widgets. And if you have done any Grafana dashboard before, you know how crappy that is. So, hurrah for me. And here, I won't compare the payload, I won't compare the HTTP status code. I just look at the graph and say, eh, it looks similar. And it looks similar, right? The, the scale is different, but it looks pretty similar. Here I have this and this, here I have this and this, and here it goes like this, and here it goes like this. So from, it's similar, I can deploy. Um, but yeah, wait a bit, I cannot deploy that easily. I mentioned canary release, we should do canary release now. <laughs> so the thing is, you can do canary release in many different ways. You can say, oh, I will do through a header, so if I have this header, I will direct to the V2. You can do through uh, IP range, you can do through uh, like geographical location as um, computed from the IP, or you can just do it randomly, like start at 1% and increase incrementally until you reach an acceptable number. Uh, here, I will start at 50% and I will keep it at 50% because it's a stupid demo, uh, but the thing is the same. So what I do is actually, I will create my API v2, right? And I will remove the proxy mirror and I will use split traffic. So split tra traffic, in other words, is the plugin to implement canary release. And here it says, so I'm using this, the, the, the same plugin config, the first one, and it says, okay, by default, the route will have a weight of one, and this new, route, this new route that goes to the upstream V2 will have a weight of one. So one and one equals two, so there is 50% chance it goes to V1, 50% chance it goes to V2. And now we can try again. So I won't do it for 10 minutes, but over time it will average to 50%. And now we check again that everything goes according to the specification, that no user is complaining, that we actually get the same JSON payload, the same HTTP status, and we are happy. So now we, we can actually deploy the V2 for real. So let's do that. I have the V2 route. And the V2 route is just the same as the V1 route, and it's just the exact same. So now, seems like the end of the road, but it's not. It's not, you should stay for five more minutes. <laughs> you will miss the most important stuff. Now you have five minutes, say, I was right. Um, the most important stuff is now we have V1 and V2 in parallel, and probably we'll have V3 because it works so well, and V4 and V5. And if you are a manager or a team lead, you are in deep trouble. Because now your engineering resources must be split across all those versions. And it sucks a lot. So when you are a smart product manager, you remove versions at some point. And how do we remove stuff? Eh. So I found only one IETF draft to do that, um, that allows you to deprecate your endpoints. But a draft is better than nothing. It's better than custom stuff. And perhaps at one point it will become a spec. So it's very simple actually. It defines a deprecation header. It can be a Boolean, which you shouldn't use, but I'm using in the demo, and a date. And when you start using it, it should be a date in the future. That's why you should don't use a Boolean. Again, I'm using it, but I'm super lazy. Uh, and then there is a link header that points to the new resource to use. And finally, if you want to be extra nice, you have this sunset header. So deprecation means at this point you shouldn't use it anymore, and deprecation means at this point it won't be there. Uh, sorry, sunset means at this point it, should, it shouldn't be there anymore. So it's like in the GDK, first you announce the deprecation of an API, and afterwards, you remove it after a couple of versions. 
So that's actually very easy to do. We remove the split traffic and we rewrite the response by adding a couple of headers. As I mentioned, I'm using a Boolean, very, very bad, and I'm using the link. And here I'm reusing Nginx variables so I don't need to hard code the stuff, which is a pretty good thing to do. So here uh, I didn't run it. And I run the v1, uh, verbus. Yes, deprecated true, again, very, very bad. And the link, you should use this v2 instead. Very, very good. And now, last but not least, comes the last step. Enjoy. Because I believe if at this point you have implemented all the tips and tricks that I've shown you, uh, then the next time the business comes for v3, it will be much, much easier. And the good thing about those tips and tricks, here I've implemented them afterwards because, well, I didn't know better, but if you are able to plan them ahead, it will be much, much easier. Thanks a lot for your attention. You can follow me on Twitter, even though I don't know what is becoming of this. Uh, and if you are not sure, I'm on Mastodon and Blue Sky anyway. If you're interested about the code, everything is on GitHub, but I have a bitly link, so I know exactly how many people are looking at the code. And most of the time, I'm very, very disappointed. Uh, <laughs> and if at any point, even though the talk was not about Apache API 6, you are interested to have a look, please do it uh, so I can come here next year, if you allow me, uh, with the same employer. Thanks a lot. I have three minutes for questions. Yes. So you mentioned that the uh, new version of your API, you want to compare sending back the same payload and maybe the same two classes. So if you're introducing a new version. So the question, I, I, I know where you are going, is about, hey, that was pretty easy, right? You just add the exact same uh, API returning the sa exact same JSON payload, well, which was not JSON, and the same HTTP status. What if you want to evolve your API by introducing breaking changes, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, you can be very, very smart and say, oh, I will use the API getaway as a temporary measure to actually change the payload that is returning so I don't break my clients, right? Eh, uh, no, you shouldn't. Because this temporary measure would stay there forever. So at some point, I'm afraid that if you introduce breaking changes, that should be done across versions, and you need to bite the bullet and tell people, folks, you need to evolve, adapt, or die, right? Um, uh, yeah, so it's a pretty bad idea. I mean, if you can guarantee it's temporary, mm -hmm. you are just like buffering the pain until it bites you afterwards. But my experience with enterprise is that nothing is, nothing is temporary, it will stay there forever. Yes? So the question is about hypermedia, right? You want to, uh, okay, the, the question about hypermedia is not really a question, is you want to drive hypermedia, and I'm super pragmatic, uh, I can love hypermedia, uh, 8 OS or however you want to call it. I'm sorry, but it just doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Uh, I, it's a good idea, but you want to create, your, I mean, when you create um, your, your, your client, be it uh, a, a Java client or a JavaScript client, you don't create it to follow those hyperlinks. You create it against an existing set of APIs. So uh, I, I see the idea, but uh, the implementation is just non-existent. I'm sorry. Yes. What if I can duplicate traffic? Let's say my service is doing something, say, well, I can bring it. So the question is, 
hey, about mirroring or duplicating in traffic, what if your VDO is actually changing the state? And that's a very good question. And the answer is, how much effort do you want to put in? So are you risk adverse or not? If you change the state, then it's quite easy to actually have uh, another database with streaming changes from the V1 to the V2, and then just compare it, snapshot it, compare it. It's possible. It's just like super expensive. And I'm out of time. Thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, enjoy, enjoy DEF CONF. It's a really great conference.